Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Is gentrification inevitable? There are models of development that don't displace the vulnerable. Today on the Laura Flanders Show, I talk with an organization that is fighting back against blight and displacement. And later in the program, a few words from me on the great corporate buy-up. Do you live in a city or a business park? Find out. Welcome to our program. Our next guests are waging a struggle in Buffalo, New York, that is relevant for people living everywhere. Aaron Bartley and John Washington work with People United for Sustainable Housing. That's PUSH Buffalo, which has been pushing, mobilizing residents to create sustainable neighborhoods with quality, affordable housing, green jobs, and next generation infrastructure. Aaron's the co-founder of PUSH Buffalo. He grew up in the area and attended Buffalo Public Schools, John is one of the organization's community organizers. Welcome both. So glad to have you. It's great to be here. Let's start, let's start with you, John. Describe mm-hmm. Buffalo for people that have never been there. It's northernmost New York. It would mm-hmm. take us, what, 8 to 12 hours to drive there from Manhattan. It's mm-hmm. cold in the middle of winter. Very cold um, and very poor. Uh, Buffalo is the third poorest city in the country, sixth most segregated. So if you go to Buffalo, um, it has a downtown that is um, being reinvigorated by a lot of heavily subsidized investment. Um, it has kind of a you know corridor of wealth that kind of branches out from a new medical campus that's been constructed in the past few years. And um, you know the, on the west side, uh, we have a very vibrant immigrant community um, that has, you know, kind of mixed levels of of income and is is being gentrified. Mm. And then you have about uh, a little more than a half of the city, uh, the east side of Buffalo, which um, is is mostly black Mm. and is highly concentrated poverty. So Aaron, we first met when the Bali um, conference was uh, held there and you took all of these business alliance for local uh, living economy folks on a walking tour of Buffalo. We got a big chapter of history in that city too, industry, you name it. Right, yeah, it was first and foremost a canal town. It was the terminus of the Erie Canal and then it became an industrial powerhouse with steel and auto. And then like much of the industrial heartland, it lost its factories in a very short period of time, a 20 year period of time. And we, to some extent, haven't recovered from that, that industrial decline and deindustrialization, which was an orchestrated process that hit cities like Detroit and Cleveland as well. And so what we, our challenge really is to take what's left, which are these really beautiful looking neighborhoods with old Victorian houses um, that are struggling without the number of jobs that are needed and especially living wage jobs. And to take those assets, the vacant land, the vacant houses, and to conceive of a new economy that we then go out and build and first and foremost, I think PUSH is really building on two traditions, the community organizing tradition, which is mobilizing folks, building leadership capacity at the grassroots, doing direct action around policy and advocacy issues like high energy bills, high gas bills, lack of bank investment in neighborhoods. And then the second tradition being the community development tradition where communities themselves can envision their own futures, mm. uh, what types of housing they need, what types of infrastructure, food systems, all of that. We wish the story that you were telling were a bit more um, popular, in, which is to say well-known and mm-hmm. ubiquitous, but it's actually fairly extraordinary what you've accomplished I- in Buffalo. And to give people a bit more of a sense, I'd love to play one of the videos that you've all made. Do, do you want to introduce it? Great, yeah. So a, a big focus of ours is also how do we combine community development with job training pathways so that we as members of PUSH can actually see tangibly people being put back to work through community-based efforts. And so this video focuses in part on those training pathways and the sectors like weatherization, renewable energy, and green Mm. infrastructure that we've built. Let's take a look. Third poorest city in the country. It's very tough to get a job. You're trying just to survive. You really can't at minimum wage. I have a four hundred and twenty-two dollar gas bill. We've got such a serious problem with housing in, in Buffalo. It's a crisis. We need jobs in this area. For us, going green isn't just a lifestyle. It's about survival.
the green development zone. Um, it's a geographic space uh, where we're trying to concentrate uh, bricks and mortar development, uh, specifically uh, green affordable housing development. We want to create jobs that are about dealing with the big ticket problems in this neighborhood, energy efficiency, the indoor and outdoor environmental hazards, access to healthy food, and reusing the vacant spaces that are in their neighborhoods. The Green Development Zone is, uh, I think, a model for a new uh, form of uh, uh, you know, economic development where local communities control the resources that come into the neighborhood. PUSH you know, has worked to hold corporations accountable to local constituencies. We work together and we put people first. The National Fuel Campaign is uh, one of the campaigns that PUSH leaders and members run. Essentially, it is the idea that there's a crisis in our neighborhoods. People have to make tough choices in order to pay their gas bills, um, and we have a solution to that problem, which is insulation. If we insulate the homes, bills go down. We'll also be creating green jobs. What I like about it is every day is something else. You know, we're working on the doors one day, the floors, the ceiling, whatever it could be. Or the road I was headed, I would, I, I, I was supposed to be in jail right now. I'm not gonna lie. I know I'm something now, and it's like, wow, it's just amazing. Just me knowing that you get to grow up and you get to become somebody that people can look up to. Rodney is like, was a youth who grew up in this neighborhood and is now a man who works in this neighborhood, transforming the face of this neighborhood brick by brick. It's really about what people know they need where they live. They need access to healthy food. They need access to, to, to clear space for them to be neighbors, right? Social spaces, recreation spaces. Right across the street is the Massachusetts Avenue Project's urban farm. We have community gardens are, are scattered around some of the vacant lots that we've had. In the most mornings, I'm here by 6.30. <laughs> I'm a mom of four. I work full time. It really gives me some peace. It provides me with that outlet to start my day and also provide me with fruits and vegetables. Greens, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, cabbage. Connecting people to the Green Development Zone is really simple, right? It's about just drawing simple connections, right? The, the park that they live next to, the community center that they bring their kids to after school, their peak gas bills in their heating season, what were they like? Are they mad about that? Are they, do they find, do they think that's okay? Do they think that's fair? Do they think that's right? We're mobilizing a bunch of people who want to do something about not just the state of their own housing, but the state of this neighborhood. We need you to be visible, present, and accounted for. Great video, amazing stories. What do you want to add, John, to the picture that we get of what people's options are in Buffalo these days and why these kinds of avenues to employment are so important? I mean, they're very important because people don't have a lot of options. There isn't a lot of employment. Um, you know, I personally worked in, in collections for 10 years and despite trying to do pretty much anything but, um, always went back to that. You know, we have restaurants, we have a few other things, but really there's just not enough jobs. And right now, the argument now is being made to basically take all of our tax dollars and say, let's, let's create jobs mm -hmm. by subsidizing large corporations. And what you're seeing is options for people that don't live in Buffalo. You're seeing a, a mass gentrification where um, most of the jobs that are being brought to Buffalo, even if they are being brought there, are jobs that you know require uh, levels of education, levels of privilege that that the folks in Buffalo are just not able to access. And so it's important that 
the community development also employ people that mm -hmm. it, it can change the community by the community coming together but it can also create sustainable employment for people in the community and give them experiences that can send them on to work on some of these other projects and give them the tools and the skills to be employed from that point on so to really make it sure that it's changing humans not just the structure so how, how did you get started I mean you're starting with people that don't have a lot of resources how do you start an organization like that? Yeah, I mean, so one piece, one recognition is that there are assets that if people, community gain control over the assets, the resources, whether it's land or housing, um, that something can be built from those assets, even if they were th sort of afterthoughts and not really considered assets. So we organized through direct action. One of our early campaigns was literally putting the governor's face on 400 vacant buildings across the city that the state had taken control of in sort of a fraudulent Wall Street deal and had left for dead. And we said, well, these are in our neighborhoods. Uh, we want to take control of some of these houses and we want some investment to make up for the disinvestment that you caused. And that gave us a platform and a set of programs that we built on from, from that point on. Not only that, generated some money, as I remember. Gen generated some revenue and, and allowed us to, to really reinvest in other projects and, and gain development capacity. Because you were able to prove that he wasn't fulfilling the pledges he'd made and the grounds on which he had That's appropriated right. and, his I mean, In that case, it was just the opposite. These houses were getting set on fire. They were really, uh, really uh, diminishing the quality of life in neighborhoods across the city. And I would say one example of building on that success is that now we've created other social enterprises like uh, a, a company that does green infrastructure, which is rain gardens, bioswales, uh, projects that help us manage our water mm -hmm. rather than having sewage go into our Great Lakes. They help us clean our, our Great Lakes. And that's a sector that we at a community level could really control. And how does your fight for, I mean, you have it on your shirt, mm -hmm. sustainable housing how is that fight different from the fight that we see in so many cities around affordable housing? Is that a distinction that, that you make? Affordable kind of just references like the, race, the relationship between your income and what you're charged in rent. And sustainable adds a layer of using green energy, um, of you know using weatherization, um, solar and geothermal energy to make living in the home more affordable by lowering your bills. So it's not enough to say your rent's going to be lower than normal, but we want to make sure you're paying as little as possible for your electric and your heat. Um, and also more sustainable for you as a human being, but also for the environment and you know, not using the fossil fuels, natural gases, and the things that are getting extracted and, and creating climate change. So I think there's you know, a, the interplay between the two that make this a more sustainable world for everybody. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, just pick up on a, what John said around the just transition frame. That's one way of thinking about the work we do and, and really that the role that banks play in extracting wealth from our community, the role that big corporations have played in removing work from our community is in some ways very similar to the extraction that occurs in our environment. Um, you know, the ga natural gas extraction, the fracking, uh, some of the gas that we use in Buffalo is fracked gas. And so putting all those pieces together and building an analysis around where we need to go, more localized job creation, uh, sectors that are good for the earth, not bad for the earth, and really trying to be first into some of those sectors so that there's community direction and community leadership rather than just large corporate uh, projects. We, were, we did a special on what happened in Baltimore and the roots of the uprising there last year after the police killing. and. What was so striking to me was the, the people that said, we want change, we just want to be part of that change, mm -hmm. and who got the message very clearly constantly that mm -hmm. the change that was happening was not for them. Mm -hmm. the, the, the supermarket that opened, 7-Eleven didn't take food stamps, didn't take SNAP. That you can, you have figured out how to have an input in change. I think it's something other people would like to emulate. Is this unique to, to Buffalo? How, how'd you, what would be your advice to people elsewhere? Yeah, I'll just say, yeah, so I think you, you, you know, hit it on the head that it's really about what does development mean? Mm -hmm. Does development just mean a, an external party comes up with a project and all of a sudden it's in your neighborhood? Or is there a community process around it? And there's some great examples of others who are doing this. The, the city of Boston and some of the groups, Dudley Street, Dudley neighborhood, Street Initiative, neighborhood Initiative, Lawrence Community Works uh, in, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, they kind of pioneered the idea of community control of land and of housing. And you can see long term that that has been really essential to preserving those particular parts of that region as affordable, diverse, 
Uh, How does that work? I mean, you have an urban land trust as, as mm -hmm. a part of your project. John, you want to talk to that? I mean, I think how it works is is if you have, and we have a community development committee, we have people in the neighborhood that are working towards getting everybody together on the same page as to what they want the, the vision uh, for the neighborhood to, to be. And I think that um, the beauty of it is being able to have that that influence and being able to see that vision of people who, like, like you said, in Baltimore are never really asked, what do you want your neighborhood to look like? And are sometimes deeply convinced that they're never going to have that opportunity. Um, and then when you add the capacity of, you know, being able to have access to people in, in urban planning and land banking and, um, you know, land use law and people who know how to, how to logistically create that vision, I think that's, you know, that's the beauty of the combination that, um, you know, makes it kind of unique, although other folks have done it around the country, is that you may have people who say, you know, I want, I want my neighborhood to look different, um, but to have the infrastructure there that says that that, that statement, I want this to be here, can be explained, well, this is what you knew, need to do mm -hmm. to get that this is the people that we need to move um, this is the paperwork that needs to be filed and um, you know the entire process is is empowering the people and we have a lot of folks now that you know really you know I think one of the unique things in coming from working with other organizations is that when people see physical things created it, it creates a belief um, that really washes away all of the, I wouldn't say even apathy, but all of the conditioning that says you are not going to be part of this change. Mm. So I think the, the beauty comes from the, the combination of the infrastructure and the organizing. Can people still own their houses in it when it's a land trust? So there are a whole bunch of models. Um, we've focused our development primarily on affordable rental housing. Um, we've partnered with groups like Habitat for Humanity. There's another group in Buffalo called Homefront to, to do first-time homebuyer projects. And we see uh, the need for a mix. Um, there are some folks who don't want to own a house, um, aren't really interested, aren't, aren't, don't have the financial capacity to do that. And there are others who do. Um, and, and really, for us, it's about, are you, do you have long tenure in the neighborhood? Are, are you seeing it as your future? Are you invested in it? And in most cases, folks on the west side are. So I'm hearing political organizing, some laws, some lawsuits, some incredible mapping of your community in terms of what's available for, for change, and, and then just endless community organizing, uh, working with people on the ground. You talked about one thing we haven't touched, well, you touched mm -hmm. on something we haven't talked about yet, and that has to do with uh, policing. Mm -hmm. Can we do what you're talking about, which is labor intensive, people intensive, even resources intensive, while we are embroiled, as many of our cities are, in the struggle around policing and security and, and funding, mm -hmm. putting so much of our state funding and city funding into police. I mean, I think, I think we have to. I think um, there really is no other way to do it. I think, you know, the policing issues are, are deep-rooted. Um, they're rooted in, in the institutions of this country, and I think uh, one thing I've, I've learned in working with PUSH is that um, building alternatives, building new and positive things is, is far more effective. I think, you know, we, we need to be confronting the issues with race and policing. We need to be confronting the oppressions, but the reality is that if we're not creating jobs, if we're not creating ways for people to just live and exist, um, then there's always going to be this tension around poverty and crime uh, because it's very difficult to talk about crime and work through crime and police accountability unless people are living sustainable lives. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, in addition to the organizing that's going on, um, obviously right now in, in, in Chicago and Minneapolis, and um, the organized responses to the oppressions that come from policing, um, communities need to hopefully come together to also support themselves in other ways and I think that's you know direct and one of the most threatening things when you have when you when you're afraid of the police um, but the reality is to control of resources in your neighborhood is what's going to give you the greatest influence over what goes on in your neighborhood and and I see that we still have issues um, with police is, uh, on the west side especially with a, a lot of our, our immigrant kids at our youth center um, but the fact that the center is there and the fact that you know people like us are there to help advocate for them um, is re really what needs to happen in between the protests and these these kind of moments uh, where people are rising up and recognizing it's how do we build an infrastructure that takes mm -hmm. that energy and and spreads it around to the different aspects that you know the police are like the the front line issue um, but there are so many issues behind it and we really need to start working on taking this energy and moving it beyond just you know we don't want to be murdered by the police too we want to control the decision making on every level in our communities and women where are women in this mix sustainable housing and community development is a gender issue too 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, patriarchy is institutionalized in all of our uh, all elements of our society too. I think the struggle for for women in poverty is something that is very intense in Buffalo. It's um, it's about lack of access to family sustaining wages. Um, it's about the lack of appropriate infrastructure for for children and childcare at every level, and how those through institutional histories get uh, foisted on on women in our in our culture. Um, and we you know we see a lot of folks fighting back. We see some innovative responses. I'll just go back to even our youth center is a, is a response to that lack of uh, really appropriate state infrastructure around children and after school. We open the doors to a former library and 50 kids come every come in every day and we've been able with very few resources resources to create a pretty vibrant experience um, and to me that's that is a, a gender question is you know uh, are there are there outlets are there resources for for youth, are there are there outlets for um, job training and, and pathways for all people? Was there one mm. story that stands out in your mind of getting involved in all this, or um, I think the story that stands out most in my mind is, you know, watching kind of the tension of, of working against gentrification, but still watching it happen, and seeing um, about fifteen of the youth that come to our youth center having to move to the other side of the city. One thing that doesn't get talked about enough really is, is the youth center and, and how, you know, you see people come in there, kids come in there, um, especially a lot of them are first generation kids. Um, they're, you know, put a lot of pressure on them to be the ambassadors for their entire families and to see how that space and experiencing and interacting with us and organizing um, really, you know, changes their outlook and changes the way that um, that they act in school that we hear from teachers. So I think it's it's also important that we recognize the importance of, of children and all of the things that we do because there's going to come a certain point where they're going to have to take over and I think that um, one of the things that, that doesn't get done as structurally soundly but it comes out very well is, is working with youth. John Washington, Aaron Bartley, thank you so much for coming in. It's great talking to you. Thanks. Thank you. You can get more information about Push Buffalo at our website. you can tell the difference between a city and a business park? It may not be so clear. A corporate buying boom since the financial crash is gobbling up city property and leaving us with places that are literally not our town. Purchasing took off after 2008 when foreclosure rates were high, bank loans were drying up, and record levels of commercial properties were standing vacant. Last year, major acquisitions by corporations in 100 large cities topped one trillion dollars. And by major, we do mean major. In New York, that's only counting property buys worth five million dollars or more. The great corporate buy-up is leaving us with more mega projects, more private space, and more people. But less of everything else, most noticeably less of everything public, from parks and plazas and elected governance. And with all that private space comes private police. Yeah, the reliance on armed private contractors outside of the public command is no longer only a phenomenon for our embassies in Kabul and Baghdad. Increasingly, it's the norm at home. Angry about police violence? Pushing for more effective community oversight? We may get more and more of that just as we get less and less police. There are other outcomes too. All that concentration of wealth matched by a concentration of, you guessed it, poverty. Last year, the Century Foundation reported that since 2000, the number of people living in high poverty concentrations, ghettos or slums had nearly doubled. The world's great cities have been places where the poor could make an impact on commerce, cuisine, culture. The poor can't do that in a privately owned business park. As sociologist Saskia Sassen put it recently, the corporate cities are a place where low-wage workers can work but not make. There are alternative models of development, but first we have to get to know our cities better. Just who owns what and who's getting tax breaks? Is the great corporate buy-up really what we want? Tell me what you think. Write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.
on the Laura Flanders Show, Poetry and Trans Politics, with the performance group Dark Matter. Trans women and trans feminine people have been doing feminist organizing forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that actually colonization on this land was about trans misogyny. Actually, Stonewall was about trans women and trans feminine people of color resisting police violence. Mm -hmm. Today on the Laura Flanders Show, pirates were some of the first people in the world to create democratic constitutions. Alexa Clay, co-founder of the League of Entrepreneurs and the director of the Human Agency Collective. If someone else is not doing well, that's going to affect me. So obviously, I do want to help them. And later, guest host Pamela Brown is stepping in for me for a bit. Mm -hmm. 